Good morning, everyone. Esteemed Chief Guest, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Tetanat Academy of Research and Education, our former Vice Chancellor and advisor, registrar, deans, and principals of various schools and colleges, faculty members, and my dear friends. I am Damini Ritika, and he is Shubhan, my co host, doing our first year MBBS at Chetinad Hospital and Research Institute. Today, we are gathered here to celebrate the Kargil Vijay Divas. This day is a memorable day for remembering the indomitable courage of the Indian soldiers in the Kargil War. I now invite our chief guest, Colonel Gaurav Sethi, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Shanta Ravi Shankar, and our former Vice Chancellor and advisor, Tejanath Academy of Research and Education, Dr. Bala Subramanian, to come on to this dais. The Kargil War was an armed conflict fought between India and Pakistan from May to July 1999 in the Kargil district of Jammu and Kashmir and elsewhere along the line of control and is also referred to as Operation Vijay, which was the name of the Indian military operation to clear out the Kargil sector. The war ended with India emerging victorious and regaining possession of Kargil. Around 2 lakh soldiers had participated in the war and we had lost around 527 soldiers as our casualties. Sri Atal Bihari Vyajpai was the Prime Minister during the period of the war. The Prime Minister of India visits Amar Jawan Jyoti in New Delhi and pays homage to the soldiers. The whole of India pays tribute to the courage and sacrifice of our brave soldiers on this day. Kargil Vijay Divas is a day for all Indians to feel proud of our brave and courageous soldiers. Prayer, a tool which connects every one of us to the Supreme. Now I request the first year MBBS students to sing the prayer song. divine melody indeed. I now invite our former Vice Chancellor and Advisor, Chetinar Academy of Research and Education, Dr. Bala Subramanian, to welcome the gathering and share his thoughts. Esteemed the Chief Guest of this day, Colonel Gaurav Seth, most respected Vice Chancellor of our university and our distinguished faculty members, my student friends, good morning every one of you. We all assembled here to celebrate, to pray to pay our homage to the soldiers who lost their lives in the Kargil War, where the country has 
own and could be able to recover back our area in the region of Kargil. Fine. When we decided to celebrate this day, we thought we should invite very appropriate chief guest for this day who has rich experience in this kind of war from the army service. A third person. Fortunately, today we have with us the Colonel Gaurav Seth and his colleague. It's a great fortune, I would say, because Colonel Gaurav, although he was born in Dharadun and basically a commerce graduate, but highly fascinated to serve in the army and he made remarkable service for the last 25 years and he could, he could be able to serve from the plains to the uphill, even the icy area like Leh and Ladakh, very close to the area of Kargil. And his knowledge and wisdom and his contributions to the Indian Army made him to be the director for recruitment and he is currently placed in Chennai and he is responsible for recruiting the young individuals for, to serve in the army. Rather. So that way we are so fortunate today and with the folded hand I welcome uh, Dr. Colonel uh, Gaurav Seth for this wonderful day. Needless to say the dedication of our beloved Vice Chancellor, Madam, and she has thoroughly given her full academic support as well as the guiding spirit for all our activities in our campus. On your behalf and on the behalf of management, I also invite our Madam for this wonderful day. And for the benefit of our chief guest, I am proud to say, sir, this university is one among top 100 universities in the country. And we are one among 39 institutions in medical university. And we are also, above all, one of the prestigious Indian ranking. We are A++ with 3.71 ranking. And such a prestigious institution because of the dedication of our faculty members, the management support, as well as the above all, the students who are giving the wonderful output from this campus. Ultimately, we could be able to reach the status. I always say we are young university because we are only about 14 years university, whereas the accomplishments made within this period is definitely is remarkable and that we could be able to achieve because of the fabulous infrastructure that is being created by our management. Especially the managing trustee who has a far-sighted vision to develop this campus right from his young age and he is more like an army man. He could be able to develop this campus in such a way ultimately this campus has become clean campus, green campus, and smart campus. And perhaps you would have noticed that we have such a wonderful thing. This is the only campus where about 1,500 cycles are being constantly used by the faculty and students rather, only to maintain the green campus conditions. And we also give us our energy requirement is tradition is fulfilled by the um, the, the, the traditional uh, energy services rather. I mean the solar energy and wind energy we could be able to utilize a large portion for this campus rather. So such a wonderful campus we never uh, we are, we, we are, as I mentioned that we are always do our excellent services in academic forum no doubt and equally we, uh, we never fail in our activities to celebrate the functions like this Cargill Vijay Awards, 
because this is also most important activity. We need to motivate many of our young students as well as our faculty. In fact, I'm very proud to say half a dozen faculty members, they served in army and they are with us. And constantly they used to give the special speeches to the, our students on, through our, the NSS program as well as our Bharat Unnathabhyan program. They, they give their speeches. They explain how they were serving in the army during wartime also. Because such is the contribution of our doctors. And predominantly they are all physicians and clinicians. They could be able to serve. And they are now serving with us. And they are the role model for this kind of functions also. And let us give a big hand for those doctors who served in army and, and be with us to contribute to their academic services. My dear young minds, see why we should assemble, why we should celebrate. We know that this is the day. But when we have a chief guest like our colonel, definitely he will enlighten us with a lot of ideas and new things whereby we could be able to know how they toiled in the army and how they protect our country, how they make us to be happy and live in this area. Because we could be able to be happy because of the, the role played by our Indian army. And without them, it is difficult. You all know that India is located in a strategic way because we have threat from all the ways. We can easily reach by air, we can easily reach by water, we can easily reach by land. We are witnessing our neighbors may be friendly, our neighbors may also pose a threat, but see, the whole thing is being tackled mainly by our Indian Army. Indian Army, I mean, all the three important forces. Without them, it is difficult for us to do things. It is very, very difficult. And that way, we, the services rendered by our Indian Army is very phenomenal and for which we all should bow our head and which we are for to show that, that kind of our gratitude to the Indian Army, we invited our Colonel Rodder. And I am sure this, the speech of our Colonel will be very useful to our young minds to as a mark of giving our respect to them as well as to celebrate the victory over Cargill Rodder. And let us give a, once again a big hand for our colonel as well as for our services rendered by all the one. With this, it's a great opportunity for me to be with you and I thank the authorities for inviting me to deliver the welcome address. Thank you one and all. Thank you, sir. I now request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Shanta Ravi Shankar, to share some special words on this special occasion. <coughs> Honorable Chief Guest, Colonel Gaurav Sheth, Director, Army Recruitment Office, Chennai, uh, our uh, respected former Vice Chancellor, Dr. Balasubramaniam, who is our advisor for Chetnad Academy of Research and Education, senior faculty members, our uh, registrar, vice principal, staff, and my beloved students. It is with great honor and privilege that I stand before you today because it's a real great honor to have with us our chief guest, Colonel Gaurav, who has a vast experience, as our former Vice Chancellor said, of 22 years with the staffing and commanding. And he has been in the plains of Punjab. He has also been in Leh Le and Ladakh, and also in the Northeast, which is a very beautiful place. And sir, it's very kind of you for having spared your valuable time to be with us on this special day of Kargil Vijay Devas. Now this day, the 26th of July, is being observed 
to commemorate the brave the bravery of our soldiers of the indian army who have fought in the borders at kargil in the district of jammu and kashmir and this war went on for a period of about 60 days and more from may to july 1999 and once the infiltrate the border was infiltrated by the pakistani army and this news reached the indian government they launched the operation vijay and as the name of the operation vijay the indian army emerged victoriously from this war which ended by july 26 and then we got this day to be called as kargil vijay devas by our former prime minister atal bihari vajpayee it is our time now to really be proud of our indian armed forces and we have to respect and pay homage to all the martyrs of our indian soldiers about more than about 500 of them have lost their lives during this war and uh, they were about more than about as our vice chancellor former vice chancellor said about 2 lakh people who were in the war field who fought for us and so as to enable us to enjoy this peace and bring oneness among us which we call as india so we have to be very proud of this indian army which has fought for us and i request you all to give them a big applause for what they have done and for the supreme sacrifice the supreme sacrifice which is made by the families who lost their brothers the fathers the husbands and we know what it is to lose such a valuable person from the family so we have to be really we have to honor them and we have to pay homage to those lost souls and we have to pray for their families and be very supportive of them i thank one and all for this great opportunity and i am once again thanking our armed forces and our colonel gaurav and his colleague who is here today with us to commemorate this day thank you one and all thank you ma'am now i request our vice chancellor dr shanta ravi shankar to felicitate the chief guest with a memento Thank you ma'am. Now on behalf of our college I would like to welcome our chief guest Colonel Gaurav Sethi of the Indian Army. He is constantly working towards improving and advancing the Indian Army by recruiting the right people for the prestigious Indian Army. We are highly grateful to you sir for accepting our invitation and coming all the way to our college. Colonel Gaurav Sethi was born in Dehradun, Uttarakhand where he grew up. He completed his graduation in BCom. He had then joined the Indian Military Academy and completed his training of one and a half year and passed out in december 1999 sir had then got in commission in the regiment of artillery unit 133 medium regiment he has a vast staff and command experience ranging from the plains of punjab to the frozen frontiers of leh and ladakh to the beautiful northeast he has been in service for 22 years and has been posted in chennai as director army recruitment office for the second time now a university chetinad academy of research and education is a multidisciplinary institute and includes medicine nursing law architecture physiotherapy and pharmaceutical sciences i would like to invite our esteemed chief guest colonel garu sethi to share his ideas with us and the opportunities and roles of our students in the army a very good morning to everyone uh it gives me an immense pleasure and uh, a singular honor for me as well to be part of these 
such an august gathering in such an esteemed organization. Take it forward at the outset, I take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, the Vice Chancellor, the previous Vice Chancellor, uh, the Registrar, and all the faculty members who thought it appropriate to call us so that we can be also be a part of the celebrations being held here. So thank you so much for inviting us. You know, the uh, start point of my speech has already been usurped by the previous speakers right from the master of the ceremony initially and then the, uh, the chancellor and the, uh, the former chancellor have already brought out actually why do we celebrate the Kargil Vijay Divas. But I shall still uh, endeavor to paint the picture of the war in front of you and try and uh, transpose you from this auditorium uh, to the locations where the war was fought. And when I do so, I shall also make an endeavor to bring out certain lessons which this war in particular threw towards us and which I am sure if we inherit in our lives, even as common civilian citizens, it will do a lot of good to us. It will uh, make our lives more disciplined, our thought process more structured and maybe give a meaning also. So this, uh, as brought out earlier, Kargil Vijay Divas and today being the 23rd Kargil Vijay Divas is being celebrated to commemorate India's victory in the Operation Vijay or the Kargil War of 1999. The war actually began when the Pakistani forces, uh, you know, disguised as Kashmiri infiltrators or the Kashmiri terrorists infiltrated on the Indian side of the line of control and they took over the winter vacated posts of the Indian Army. Erstwhile, few years back or maybe 20 years back, what used to happen, come the severe winters, the high altitude posts used to get vacated and the troops used to go to the summer uh, posts. So the Pakistani forces actually utilized this period and this opportunity to occupy those vacant posts under their control. The aim was simple. The aim was to cut off the strategic National Highway 1 Alpha. Now, what is National Highway 1 Alpha? National Highway 1 Alpha joins Jammu and Kashmir to the rest of Leh and Ladda. So by doing this, by cutting off uh, the National Highway 1 Alpha, what the Pakistani forces would have achieved is isolated our troops in the Siachen Glacier and then bring India to a negotiation table where they would have sought the settlement of the long-standing uh, uh, Kashmir uh, dispute. The war was fought in high altitude region with you know jagged near vertical uh, wall uh, hill faces which posed both tactical and logistic issues. The area that witnessed the war was approximately 160 kilometers long stretch of ridges, which was overlooking the National Highway 1 Alpha. The military posts on the ridge, ladies and gentlemen, just think that these posts were located at the heights ranging from 15,000 feet to 18,000 feet. Those were the altitudes at which this war actually took place. Kargil war was also, in a way, a groundbreaking occurrence in the history of Indian Army. In fact, it was the, uh, the army or the defense forces prior to that also had fought around uh, four wars right from 1947 onwards. But this was in the year of 1999, the first war which actually reached the drawing rooms of the citizens when it was being fought. We had a number of reporters interviewing the soldiers who were actually fighting the war from the ground zero. Those who were there at that point in time, you would recollect artillery buffos firing across the hills during the Kargil war. So the first time the sacrifices, the hardships, the nobility of the spirit and the war pains were displayed intensely 
to raise national consciousness through electronic and print media. This war, as, as has been brought out, it was fought for a period of almost close to three months uh, from the early part of May when the intrusions were uh, deducted and till 26th of July where finally the victory was claimed. This was in the areas, what we keep hearing is the Kargil. Now, please remember that the place of Kargil actually had the least amount of war. It was, the war was essentially fought in the areas of Batalek, Dras and Mashko Valley. Kargil happened to be a known town closer to these areas and hence the Kargil war. The Kargil war was codenamed, uh, as already brought out, was codenamed Operation Vijay. Now the question arises here. The war was started by Pakistan. The aggressor or the initiator was Pakistan. They had a planned methodology towards this. They were the ones who were occupying the heights. They were well fortified, but still they lost. What were those factors that the Indian forces could beat the Pakistani forces hands down? Now, let's keep the military tactics to one side. Let's keep the synergy or the war fighting scheme of things to one side. And let's focus upon the human resource component of the war. Now, these are the few tangible aspects that were, that were displayed by our forces in abundance. And in my books, these were the leadership, especially the junior leadership at the ranks of, let's say, colonels and below. The efficacy of training they had undergone and last but not the least, the teamwork. So let's take them one by one. Let's take the brilliant junior leadership that I was talking about. You all must have heard the names of Captain Vikram Batra, Lieutenant Manoj Pandey, Lieutenant Balwan Singh, Subedar Sanjay Kumar Yadav, Subedar Yoginder Singh Yadav. Few of them are not there. They laid their supreme sacrifice of their lives. And few of them are actually living legends as we speak. Now, these were the young officers, junior commission officers and other ranks who fought the war. And many of them, and many more actually, fought these wars at the heights of 15,000 feet, 18,000 feet. Uh, they were young guns. They were barely in the early 20s. But they displayed raw courage, steely resolve, and daredevilry of highest order in the face of enemy. What were they fighting for? Is what, was it totally patriotism that they were fighting for? It was the love for their country. It was the singular aim of protecting the territorial integrity of their country. They belonged to different outfits. In the army, we call them units or battalions or regiments. They were fighting for the izzat and the honor of their own unit and own outfit and own regiments and battalions. They were fighting for those who were fighting along with them. And these ladies and gentlemen, remember, they were young guns, not even 24, 25 at that point in time. You know, there was a war cry by late Captain Vikram Batra. Whenever his team used to capture a particular objective, so on the radio set, he used to tell his commanding officer, now he has to inform his superior that he's, he's been successful. He's captured the objective. So he used to have a victory cry of Ye Dil Mange More. During the Kargil War, it became a national war cry. Anywhere and everywhere, the newspapers, the print media, everybody covered Ye Dil Mange More as if it was there from since very beginning. You know, late Captain Vikram Batra said, and I quote, Either I will come back after hoisting the tricolor or I will come back wrapped in it. But I will come back for sure. Unquote. That was the spirit. Another one. This was written by Lieutenant Manoj Pandey in one of his letters back to his family. If death strikes before, 
I prove my blood. I swear, I'll kill the death. So what I'm trying to highlight is the passion of these young leaders. What I'm trying to highlight is the motivation these young leaders had at that point in time. Such was the spirit of these young officers. You know, after capturing one objective, they never wanted rest or a period of rest. They used to tell their superiors, please give us one more objective. We want to capture that also. They never wanted to lose the momentum they had gained. By one, they ensured that the heights of Tololing, Tiger Hill, Jubar, they are all free from the enemy presence and own positions are retained. In fact, I, this is my personal opinion. I personally feel that these legendary tales and facts should be part of our primary and secondary textbooks also to inspire our young minds. Then comes training. We have a saying in army, the more you sweat during training, the less you shall bleed in war. Ladies and gentlemen, no amount of training, studies and preparation goes waste. Our forces, as I mentioned, they were fighting at the heights exceeding 15,000 feet. While you can be determined, you can be a motivated soldier, but if you are not trained well, you will have a limited success. And I feel there is no age bracket for learning. We need to constantly evolve and grow. During Operation Vijay, all ranks, be it the senior most hierarchy or the last soldier, they ensured that whatever they have learned over their military life was put to use. Now, if you have some time, please go on to Google and read the authentic inputs about this war. You will realize that the Pakistani forces were simply outmaneuvered tactically. I mean, in spite of being well entrenched, well fortified at heights, well prepared, they just could not predict our reactions, which were both swift and show. Then comes the third issue or the third intangible that I spoke about earlier was the teamwork and the camaraderie. Now the Indian soldiers worked as a team. Teamwork is the ability to work towards a common vision. It gives fuel to the quality that people to achieve uncommon result. It gives fuel to the common people to achieve the uncommon results. The young leaders motivated their teams to achieve the unachievable. Now please take your mind towards the areas probably where this war happened. 15,000 feet, 16,000 feet, ice clad mountains, operations in darkness, fear of unknown, enemy is firing on you from the top. You don't know, every step is closer to death. Even if you are well trained, the soldiers can get overwhelmed. And here came the difference what their leaders made in their lives. The junior leaders ensured that the teamwork is never staggered. It's the teamwork which continues and they ensured that the men they are leading or the men they are commanding do not get affected by these thoughts and remain motivated up and above to execute and achieve the task. Which you all shall agree that the army did it in a very, very stupendous manner. The life in army requires discipline, it requires loyalty, it requires passion. And there's a fourth quadrant to it, which is a self-coined quadrant as far as I'm concerned, is the ability to push your limits. To give up is very easy. You can give up at any stage. You can have a comma in your sentence at any time and full stop, full stop in the end. But what matters is to complete the story. What matters is to have mental robustness. You can achieve physical fitness through training. But no amount can actually strengthen your mind. It is you and alone you who can do that. 
it is the army training which teaches you to react in a situation which is unknown to you in a situation where your men are looking up to you for orders it is a situation where your one order can lead to either hierarchy or harakiri my apologies or victory coming back to kargil war i shall just conclude that the kargil war will go down in the history as a legend of bravery raw courage endurance and highest form of leadership displayed by indian army ladies and gentlemen there is no other profession where personality training is more important war as you will agree is the domain of danger and to live in this domain or the events of danger and daring courage and motivation are required when the soldiers perform they transmit their identities in their organization they repost their own faith and trust amongst themselves and amongst the hierarchy they are under which the organization per se you know the at the end of the day the completion of task begins becomes the ultimate goal it becomes the supreme agenda and therefore it is said when the going gets tough the tough gets going kargil war in my view is just not a story of winning it is a story of pain and pride a story when will which when you hear you will have tears of grief with a joyful smile so kudos to those who could participate in that war personally i missed the war by 6 months the war finished in june 1999 and i got commissioned as an officer in december 1999 jcos who were part of this war were fortunate and those who live today are legends thank you ladies and gentlemen for hearing me out i shall sign off by saying always stand tall have faith in your abilities believe in the process as i earlier said throw the giving up option out of the window and stay motivated sooner and surer you will not go you will not have to go and find the success success will reach you thank you and jai hind i was also uh, given to understand that some students have few queries and doubts uh, you can please shoot and if i am able to answer them i'll try and do that and in case Uh, there is something which i cannot answer at this point in time i'll endeavor to go back and find suitable answers and reach back to you thank you sir for enlightening us with your knowledge and wisdom Now we have understood the role of our students and youngsters in the army, especially in the Indian Army. After hearing from um uh, for time being with the questions to a maximum of 10 because many of the students were asking about uh, the the process of you know fighting kargil war and uh, what made them
to succeed, uh, um, you know, though the, the opponent has intruded first, uh, we could win it against them, you know, the strategies and the logics that they have adopted, you know, those things were already highlighted by our chief guest colonel. Um, what I want are from a few of the students who have voiced their questions is that they were uh, talking about risks or they have written few questions. I mean, many students have written about uh, the risks that, uh, you know, being in army or in, you know, armed forces, uh, many of the parents or, you know, the relatives will think, you know, we are risking our life, you know. And we used to hear, you know, joining army is like we are running out of uh, the house and then, you know, no, no, he walked away from the house and he went for army, you know. These are, you know, negative side of, you know, talking about, uh, you know, joining armed forces. Um, as young minds, uh, you know, we used to hear that. I mean, even right now, many of the parents of these students may be hesitating to, you know, allow the students to join army. I mean, what is it? Is it real or, I mean, is it unnecessary or is it uh, the affection that the relatives have on us is making us to feel like that or what is the reality or, you know, what made you to take up this as the you know, profession or the service, sir. I mean, this is the first question that we want to hear from you. Uh, hope that you will motivate us or you will remove the fear that we have in our mind. Okay. Uh, what motivated me first? I will discover that to join the army. Uh, well, I guess I belong to Dehradun where the Indian Military Academy is next door. So, uh, uh, we used to pass by as youngsters, we used to see smart looking gentlemen cadets doing uh, the training uh, on the drill parade and then uh, there is something called a process of uh, uh, liberty. Now what is a liberty? Liberty is when these gentlemen cadets were given one day off from their training on Sundays or a national holiday and then they could come out in batches to the city to enjoy a meal or uh, you know just go around the city have fun and then be back before the last light. So as civil youngsters, we, when we used to roam around the market with no aim, I used to see these young boys, uh, uh, you know, 18, 19, 20 years of uh, age, smartly dressed, a uh, uh, lot of confidence in their stride and a lot of uh, exuberance they used to have. That is where my first motivation uh, kind of crept in. And uh, 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 God, God was lucky, I gave my CDS exam, got through and then did my training in the Indian Military Academy for one and a half years. Now coming to this uh, thought process of thinking that while you join the armed forces, you are risking your lives. Well, I guess uh, all parents think emotionally, so there is nothing wrong firstly for the parents to think that way. Well, yes, it's uh, actually their own child uh, which they are talking about. I have put in 23, 24 years service, that ladies and gentlemen, I am there. <laughs> I am there to speak to you. So please put the rest Please put your doubts to rest. The training that is imparted to you, the disciplined life that you live, will ensure that once you are inside the force, you will not even think twice on this aspect. So, till you have not joined, you may be that iota of doubt may still continue to be there in your minds. But once you join, once you get trained, once you live as a family, once you see the insights, this particular thought never occurs to you. You always want to hone your craft. You want to remain fit. You, remain, you, you want to do anything and everything which ensures that you have a longevity of life in profession where you can serve, continue to serve your motherland. So while it's okay for the parents to think that way, but from my side you can go back and tell them that the army will train us and Please stop thinking about death and negatives here, here and after. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving us reassurance uh, that it is no more riskier than doing any other profession. The other question many of our students wanted to know is that what is the basic education? I mean, meaning somebody wants to join these armed forces. I mean, there are different levels of education. Our institute is a multidisciplinary institute and uh, they are all undergoing graduate programs at UG level and PG level starting from medicine. Uh, we have uh, dental medicine with us and we have pharmacy, physiotherapy, even law we are uh, 
uh, having, uh, you know, people who have joined with us in architecture and allied health sciences who are helping the physicians. I mean, um, other than this, we have a general education in the community like, you know, uh, humanities, arts and science and engineering, you know. Uh, I mean, I mean, we can understand. I mean, army has hospitals and air force has hospitals and doctors do find a, their role in, uh, you know, such hospitals. Nurses are finding their role. I mean, we can understand it. We can orient from this point of view. I mean, anywhere we have a hospital, definitely medical and paramedical people will find their role. Um, they, they play a vital role. We are talking about war situations where people get injured, um, you know, uh, soldiers get injured. We, we definitely play a vital role. Uh, but then, other than this medical aspect of it, uh, what is the education that people can, uh, you know, do before they join army? I mean, people even, we heard that they finish their 10th standard or 12th standard and then they go and join army at some level and then they do some other degree programs or PG programs and we are talking about, you know, cyber security and, you know, intelligence and uh, those things. Uh, you encourage people with, uh, you know, a lot of uh, software knowledge and other domain knowledge to be part of um, army. So, can you just enlighten us, you know, uh, the basics that we need to do before we join army at different levels? Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, express my appreciation for the uh, medical fraternity, both in the CV street as well as uh, in the army as such, or the defense forces per se. So, they're doing a stupendous job, so three cheers to them. Then comes the uh, opportunities for, uh, let's say, students from the medical uh, background. Uh, well, I actually am a, from a regular army in the sense that I am from artillery. So I do not really have a, too much of a background knowledge uh, for the medical students per se. Uh, but yes, there are seats, uh, reserved seats uh, uh, at the officers level. There is something called military nursing services, uh, which is open to the females. And of course, below officer level, uh, the nursing assistants, as we call them, are also there. But if you go on Google, you'll be able to find out. Not be saying the same, should the faculty need, we can organize a separate lecture dedicated entirely to the uh, medical uh, entries which are there. Because they have a kind of a uh, uh, slightly different mode to enter the armed forces, unlike what the regular officers uh, get into. No, as, and in brief, as far as the uh, regular scheming of things is concerned, we've got a number of entry points. And these entry points for officer's rank actually start from class 12th onwards. So you pass your class 12th exam, give a UPSC, and then go to, uh, let's say, National Defense Academy for three years of training. Post that three years, you do a one-year training at Indian Military Academy, Dehradun. So total of four years of training before you become officers. That is post class 12th. Now let's say you're, you're in class 12th. Uh, you've still not decided whether you want to join uh, the armed forces, you want to explore the niceties of college life, you want to grow and mature more and then probably join uh, the forces. So you can do a graduation and there is no embargo as far as any stream of graduation is concerned. So like I'm a commerce uh, student, yet part of artillery which is a semi-technological uh, arm. So uh, that way, so once you do your graduation, you give the CDSC exams. So once you get through, uh, you are called for the SSB, that is the uh, interview board, you face the interview board, go through the medicals, and for one and a half years, you join the Indian Military Academy, and after which you become uh, officers. Thirdly, there is an, uh, this, uh, then third is the short service officers, which is again uh, post your graduation. Now, you want to become an officer, but you are not very sure that you want to serve the complete road. So there is an opportunity for you wherein, in this case, both uh, girls and boys, wherein you can join the uh, officer training academy, which is in Chennai itself. Post graduation, you again give exams, give the short service exam as one of the choices, and then you can join for short service. Uh, you join for five years, it can get extended to another five years, a total of 10 years. And post that, then you have to think whether you want to continue or whether you want to quit. The choice is entirely yours. And OTA Chennai is open for both for uh, male and female cadets. So that is where. Now, if you happen to have a technical background, wherein, let's say you're following uh, uh, 10 plus 2 PCM, or in the graduation you're following the engineering stream, there also you have two different schemes for entry. 
in one when in in case you've done 10 plus 2 pcm then you join the technical entry scheme so during the training your graduation is counted so post your three years of training you you become a graduate in the engineering stream and then join uh, straight away as an officer in fact you become officer during your training itself unlike other entries wherein you are the you are a gentleman cadet as as when you are getting trained and you become officer thereafter once you finish your training but the, for the technical entry scheme and the engineering back uh, background schemes you can become officer in the last year of your training itself so that's how in general uh, as far as the officers uh, uh, cadre is concerned no i don't know whether there is a question coming up uh, uh, but i'll just uh, shoot the point here only so there's something called other than officers category also which is the junior commission officers or the other rank of course you do not become a direct junior commission officer you actually get uh, enrolled as an other rank and then you uh, climb the steps of your profession and get promoted to a junior commission officer less one entry which you can straight away become and that that's for the religious teachers so you could have a religious uh, denomination or a religious uh, background you, you know to be a pandit a granthi or a pastor uh, actually to have a degree and then get into the armed forces to, for doing the religious ceremonies now for this other rank category a new scheme has been launched by the government of india on 14th of june which i am sure uh, you all would have heard because it's been widely uh, covered uh, uh, as a matter of debate and discussions which is called the agnipat and those who get enrolled will be known as agnivir so this agnipat scheme per se it's a scheme which allows you to come uh, get enrolled as other rank or as agni veer for a period of 4 years out of this period of 4 years the first 6 months will be dedicated towards your training and the remaining 3 and a half years will be where you will be serving whichever outfit you are uh, allotted post 4 years 25% of the enrolled agni vees will be given will be will continue to serve with they will be asked they have to give an option yes i want to serve and depending upon the merits uh, or the merit score which he would have earned over the period of time so it will get decided whether he continues or he gets released or he is part of that 75% which is getting released and going back to the civil society now what the government has done is those who go back to the civil society have been empowered and how have they been empowered they have been empowered both financially as well as academically financially they will be given a severance package or a seva nidhi package of close to 11 and a half lakhs so i always keep telling young boys and uh, girls you know imagine now this entry is open from 17 and a half years to 21 years of age so imagine yourself or maybe your relative you know 18 or 19 years of age with a minimum qualification of class 8 or 10th and that also basic qas of you know having an overall of 45% and Uh, aggregate of 45 percent, individual subject 33 percent. At an age of 20, 21, when your friends and relatives are still studying, still trying to figure out as to what they want to do in their lives, you have seen the adventure and the disciplined life for four years of army. Have come out financially capable, wherein you can you know start something of your own, use that money to uh, upskill yourself. or maybe you know whoever is in need in the family you can assist start anything small scale business and there are number of loans which the public sector banks have actually told uh, the government that we are ready to give the agni vees a loan at very very subsidized rate so that is how the financial aspect comes into uh, thing and whatever you would have saved over the period of four years from your pay that is uh, uh, you know over and above what you are getting as 11 lakhs and this 11 lakh lane gentleman is tax free there is no taxes on these eleven lakhs now academically how have you been empowered is if you get enrolled on the basis of your, of your class 10th uh, examination so by the time you complete your four year service you will be given a class 12th certificate from nios which will be valid both for further education as well for a government job you will be given an agnivir skill certificate because you've been an agnivir for four years you will be given one agni vee skill certificate which you can endorse in your resume and you will continue to be 
known as agnivir for the rest of your life thirdly there are number of uh, government services which have opened up their uh, services for these agnivirs i mean when i say opened up in terms of like capfs they have opened up 10% reservations for the agnivirs they can be laterally absorbed but post their army service they can be absorbed in uh, capfs which comes under the home ministry the aviation ministry has promised jobs in the human resource security uh, in the uh, allied uh, services so and the corporate sector you know people like reliance tata they have come up with a promise of absorbing the agnivirs post their four year service so it's a very very kind of a win win situation meant for everybody for nation for the organization and for the individual nation gets an army which is young which is effective which is technically qualified it is for the first time the uh, iti certificates or the politic certificates are being given a bonus marks in the written exam it was not there earlier if you got so that is how wherein the empowering uh, has been rolled out into the scheme so uh, uh, th th this is how these are the various entry points uh, which you can be exploited uh, to come and join the services as such thank you very much sir for, for such an elaborate response in fact we had a few questions on agnipath which you have already answered and you have uh, cleared some of the doubts people might be having in their mind one of the girl student has asked from allied health sciences what is the role played by women in indian army i mean we used to see photographs uh, maybe early once or twice that you know so many women officers have graduated or this one uh, what is the role what do they do how how they are placed uh, you know can you um, give us some idea about uh, this women in army or armed forces see as far as I, the way i see is uh, whether it's a male uh, gentleman or a female uh, we consider uh, i mean there's no gender bias actually as, in, as far as in my eyes are concerned so there are officers as far as i am concerned uh, that is one second is presently uh, the way uh, let's say the women officers are getting employed in army is i'm talking about the army per se i'm not i've not okay. uh, talked about the air force or the navy because their charter of duties for technical uh, inclined uh, jobs they get so they have a different set of uh, skill set and accordingly as per their skill, skill set they have a different uh, job sets also as far as the army is concerned presently the women officers are uh, employed on administrative duties more vis-a-vis combat duties but uh, as i see in future you never know uh, the line between the combat duties and the administrative duties may get blurred and the roles may get swapped also so that is how the women officers uh, are being employed so you have in the uh, arm of intelligence we, we have lady officers in the arm of services uh, uh, that is the army service corps or the ordnance corps the women officers are there of course the medical science uh, medical stream does have uh, doctors uh, women doctors and now even there there's an arm called uh, army air defense again we have lady officers in those uh, arms and services also so primarily that is how the role of women officers uh, has been made as per the skills they uh, achieve over the period of time and during the course okay. thank you sir i mean hypothetically can we see a situation where in future um a women officer or a woman officer is going to occupy the top post in army i say why not okay. if they can be fighter pilots they can do these these roles also but as i always say you know change takes time okay. future itself is a change what was there 10 years back uh, it has improved i'm sure as we uh, move ahead there will be changes and there will be additional roles which will be coming up and uh, in any case the women officers work in army shoulder to shoulder with their male counterparts there is hardly any difference in uh, in the thought process or, or the way the organization sees uh, these officers yes sir. well said sir thank you and uh, covid 19 i mean we know how uh, it was a struggling time time in the past two years or so and especially during the second wave we were fighting it out Uh, and we could see it it was uh, demoralizing for the common civil society to cope up with covid 19 we just want to know how it was for uh, army i mean 
was it totally shut down or how you were handling it uh, um, you know the mortality or morbidity uh, like any other common man was there a fight uh, uh, for life or you know uh, for the well being of the soldiers how how was it uh, during the tough times sir see i don't want to act and sound like superman we were not affected <laughs> you know that will be a wrong way of putting things i myself was uh, got affected by, uh, by covid in spite of taking all the precautions and my entire family was uh, and this was in the second wave where half my family got admitted in the military hospital but not withstanding that the beauty of the organization is we follow very strict standard operating procedures so what happens is you are able to combat even such uh, let's say pandemic or uh, whatever name it may have been given to uh, the covid-19 scare so you you are able to combat them you are able to ensure that your training your routine your essence of the job is not affected by these uh, ailments and diseases which are floating around so that's how and i'm sure in civil life also if one could be a no you know it's simple thing if you have to wear mask you have to wear mask I mean, there's no two ways about it but half of us want to wear don't want to wear it half of us want to wear it below our uh, noses on the chins or the, you want to flash it around your neck so it's ultimately discipline like i say counts so if you follow a disciplined life follow a structured life follow the standard operate, operating procedures which have been well thought well crafted put in place have seen the tides of time i'm sure no way uh, you will get Uh, largely affected by such things so yes the uh, forces were also affected we had cases but because of the lifestyle that we follow because of the procedures that we have the uh, the reporting and uh, the way we uh, kind of uh, you know at the end of the day for us this was handling of covid was, was also like an operation it was also a tactical situation that we were handling if you see it that way you will be able to uh, you know jot down as to these are the scheme this this these are the points which should be part of your scheme of things and you can uh, remain motivated so no way we were demoralized please uh, demoralize uh, demoral uh, how do i put it being demoralizing or being uh, subdued by such things are out of the window so uh, we don't believe in that so life continued as usual yes with some precautions and with strict adherence to the standard operating operating procedures that we have yes thank you um we we see armed forces are in closed uh, walls and uh, we i mean we could see that there is no big relationship between you know people working in armed forces and the general public uh, but sometimes we hear news is like you know uh, some disaster is happening some some terrible incidents is happening some grass internal security issues are happening we see that army is coming and then taking over or playing an active role so we want to know other than uh, the situations in uh, uh, you know war uh, times and also you know the training and other things that are part of your life do you have any other civil engagement or civil responsibility um, what is it you contribute to the civil society see army is part of the society you know we are not living uh, in different walls or boundaries wherein we get secluded and then we are concentrating on one job which is to protect the territorial integrity of the country that is the primary job and as uh, a good organization we have a secondary job also which is aid to civil authorities okay. so whenever called upon by the state government or the central agencies wherever they feel that a particular uh, natural calamity or a, a situation maybe a law and order situation has developed or snowballed in a manner wherein the local agencies or the agencies nominated to handle it otherwise will not be able to control it that is where the request comes and the army also pitches in so in our peace times we uh, train for such contingencies also apart from training for war in our peace time we train for such contingencies also we make we ensure that our procedures are tightened that we are equally kitted up for such role because these are not natural roles Uh, you like you will agree you know combating earthquake or a famine or a, a drought or uh, combating a law and order situation is, is not the natural uh, role for the forces but yet we are 
sanguine that these, this is also one of our jobs. It is for society, the army is for the nation and when called upon it has to uh, pitch in and step in. And we have a saying that we, in fact in such situations the army is also uh, colloquially uh, said as the last bastion. I mean if everything else fails, army is there, call the army or, or the defense forces. So we uh, uh, end up becoming the last standing uh, man or a woman who can counter and combat the situation at hand. Okay. So yes, we are sanguine of other roles that we have, we train for them and uh, we ensure that the uh, administratively and infrastructure wise we are up and above to, uh, to combat such, a, such situations whenever they arise. Okay. Thank you sir. Um, one second a BBS student has asked. What has been your proudest moment in uh, the Indian Army since you joined? Well, to me all 23 years have been uh, <laughs> lovely. But if I was to choose one, you know, when an officer joins the Army and he is allotted an outfit, like in my case, you know, we all have our parent units or the mother units. In my case, my unit is 133 medium regiment, which is an artillery unit. Like this may be your parent college, the school that you studied in may be your parent school or the first school that you studied in, subsequently you may have changed number of them. So my parent unit is, was rather is 133 medium regiment. So any young officer, I would like to believe that and I am very sure of it, that any young officer when he gets commissioned in any unit, he has the dream to command the same unit. He has the dream that 15 years, 16 years down the line, I will become the commanding officer of the same unit in which I am the lieutenant. It's something like you, you are the student of this college and tomorrow you want to become the principal or the vice chancellor. So that's the loose corollary you can have. So when I got commissioned, I got commissioned in a small uh, uh, town which was Moga, which is close to Firozpur. Uh, and from day one, I had this ambition that, okay, come what may. I will like to command this unit. I will like to become the commanding officer of this unit. And God was kind. In the year of uh, January 2018 in uh, Sugar Sector, which is 100 kilometers ahead of uh, Shimla towards the Chinese border, I took over my own parent unit or the mother unit in which I got commissioned. So once I became the commanding officer, that was the proudest moment. Well said. And I think one student has asked for um, related to Kargil. Um, see, we were not the one who started the war first. And when it was imposed on us, we conquered. Was there any intention, maybe as an individual, personally, was there any intention in your mind or as a group of uh, Indian Army, was there any intention of uh, further, you know, retaliating or why, why, why don't we go deep into them or you know getting into their territory what actually uh, prevented us in thinking on those lines or was there a, was there a thought process in our mind well we have to do like this or something like that this is the last question uh, we have one more question that's what the light to know see any operation uh, you war game number of situations you know, it can go either way. You uh, work on contingencies, you work on furtherance of ops. And as far as Cargill war per se is concerned, whether we had intentions of going forward, ahead, exploiting the situations that we could, victorious situations that we had finally on our hand, you know, uh, army or the defense forces in alone does not uh, plan such things. So it has to have, the government of the day also has, uh, is a, is a if not equal or if not more is an equal shareholder of the decision making. So it will be uh, uh, not correct on my part to comment on uh, uh, this particular question because firstly I was not part of the uh, war gaming or the process. So I will not, I am not the right uh, person to answer this question. More so when uh, great minds both at the uh, government level and at the uh, military hierarchy level they get together and decide for themselves ki what is the end situation they want out of this particular war. Okay. Well, uh, this is the last question, sir. I think. How is our defense now compared to the time that we were in Kargil war? Are we ready to handle any such situations or even worse situations like this? Has there been a war after Kargil? 
No. I guess that answers the question. I will like to reassure on the behalf of my organization that please be rest assured the uh, defense forces of today is way, way ahead what we were 10 years or 20 years back. We are technologically more sound capable. There are number of equipments and infrastructure which has come into the wings of the defense forces wherein uh, all nefarious designs can be thwarted and uh, I am very sure that no unruly neighbor of ours can actually think of uh, commencing a war with the Indian uh, soldiers. So that is uh, way beyond it. And then the training that the army has it for itself, constant revision, constant upskilling that ensures that we always remain up and above. So the man behind the machine and the machine, both are ready. Please don't worry. Thank you, sir. And I think we have come to the end of this interaction. And I sincerely thank on my behalf and on the behalf of the management and faculty and students for uh, taking all efforts and then answering our doubts and clarifications patiently. Thank you very much. I now request Dhamini to give the vote of thanks. On behalf of all the staff and students, I'm glad to express the vote of thanks. Firstly, I would like to thank our esteemed chief guest, Colonel Gaurav Sethi, for sparing his valuable time and sharing this, his thoughts with us. I would like to thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Shanta Ravi Shankar, our former Vice Chancellor and advisor, Dr. Bala Subramanian, who have always been a constant support, our respected registrar, Mrs. Jayendra Saraswati, deans and principals of all schools and colleges of our institute and faculty members for giving us this amazing opportunity and supporting us. I would also like to thank the admin, IT, infra, and other st support staff who have helped us in this conduct of this event. And finally, I would like to thank you all, my friends, for lending your ears all through this program and making this event possible. With a huge respect to the warriors of the Kargil, let's celebrate this victorious day by incorporating a wider sense of patriotism within ourselves and let our deeds prove it for our country, for our people, and for our mother, India. Jai Hind. I now respect you all, I'm sorry, I now request you all to rise for the national anthem.